Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and a very good morning. It is my pleasure to be an MC for today's workshop. I am Dr. Aisha Binti Abbas, a medical officer from Infection Prevention and Control Unit. And on behalf of the organizer, I would like to extend a very warm welcome to all of you. Welcome to Basic Infection Control Training Workshop for Lingness 2023. We appreciate you taking time off your busy schedules to join us today. We hope you will learn a lot today. We have a fantastic lineup of speakers who will share their knowledge, expertise, and insights on various aspects of the topic. Brothers and sisters, with the slogan, together we break down the barriers and establish a strong, strong infection uh, bridges. We do hope this workshop will be an eye-opener for us to acknowledge the importance of infection control and how to maintain a safe and clean environment, especially at SASMAC. This is especially important in the current situation as we are dealing with a global pandemic. It's crucial to follow proper protocols to prevent the spread of any infectious diseases and healthcare-associated infections. To begin the ceremony with blessing from Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, I would like to invite Brother Anajmi bin Jahidin to lead the du'a recitation. Al Fatiha. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alamin. Wassalatu wassalamu ala ashrafi anbiya wa salim. Wa ala alihi wa sabbihi ajma'in. Allahumma innaka haluka azim. Innaka sami'u alim. Innaka rafur rahim. Ya Allah. Engkau lah yang mempunyai segala kepujian. Engkau lah yang berhak menerima segala kepujian. Engkau lah yang berhak menerima segala kesyukuran. Engkau lah yang memiliki segala permintaan. Di tangan engkau segala kebajikan dan kepada engkau lah kembali segala urusan. Rabbana alaika tawakana wa alaika masir. Rabbana atina fi dunia hasanah wa fil ahirat hasanah wa kin adhaban nar. Wa sallallahu ala sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa barri wa salam. Walhamdulillah rabbil alamin. Amin, amin ya rabbal alamin. Thank you, Brother Anajimin, for the du'a. May our two-day workshop run smoothly and be blessed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, inshallah. To kick off this morning's program, we are pleased to have with us our clinical director, Professor Dr. Zamzuri bin Zakaria, to deliver the opening remarks. Please welcome. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi taala wabarakatuh. Uh, first of all, I want to welcome all the participants, especially the speakers. I think some of the speakers here come from FTA, and then some of the speakers come from Kuala Lumpur, Putrajaya, and then some of the speakers also from Sasmai. So I think uh, the basic infections uh, caused today for lingness actually is a eye-opening for SASMEC because we are still new compared to HTA. So that's why you see from nine lectures given today, only two will be given by SASMEC and seven will be given by external speakers. It's okay for me, okay? Because you can learn from each other, okay? I think before because they are more experienced than us and then we can share. And maybe the problem here and there also are similar, but maybe the approach slightly different. Okay, so I thought today the nurse will be uh, from external itself, but today it's only from SASMAC, IMSC, FSC, and I hope uh, the main burden here because is to look at the infectious control at SASMAC because if you look, 
most of the patient either from FSC or MSC, they will come to SASMEC either mainly to either clinic or wards or OT. So basic infection control, I think, is very important. So from this lecture, we hope you, my nurse here, can learn something today. Eh? So it's only one day program. So there are five lectures uh, in the morning and another four lectures after the break. So with this note, I think I will declare this uh, infectious uh, control uh, cost for lingness today open. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi ta'ala wabarakatuh. Okay, uh, thank you, Prof. Dr. Zabzuri, for the warm opening speech. I would like to invite Assistant Prof. Uh, Dr. Nur Hidayah to deliver a token of appreciation to Prof. Dr. Zamzuri. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Professor Dr. Zamzuri and Assistant Prof. Dr. Nur Hidayah. Brothers and sisters, uh, it is my pleasure to introduce our esteemed guest speaker for today's event, Dr. Norlina Binti Nordin. Dr. Norlina is an infectious disease specialist from Hospital Tengku Ampuan of Zan Kuantan. As we all know, healthcare-associated infections are a major concern in healthcare facilities around the world. They can be the cause, but they be, they can be caused by a variety of pathogens and can lead to severe illnesses, prolonged hospital stays, and even death. With Dr. Norlina's extensive experience in the healthcare industry, we are fortunate to have her here today to share her insights and expertise on this crucial topic. So, without further ado, please welcome Dr. Norlina Binti Nordin with her presentation, Introduction to Healthcare Associated Infection. Yeah, Assalamualaikum. Uh, thank you to the organizing committee for inviting me today uh, to actually uh, as an opening uh, for the talk today. So actually, um, I was um, given the task to actually um, speak on the introduction to the healthcare associated infection as an opening to the course for, uh, for today. Okay, so the learning objective that I try to cover up is actually what is actually a hospital, a healthcare associated infection, what factors that are responsible to it, uh, what is the causative organism. Uh, I will show different types of hospital uh, healthcare associated infection and how we can prevent it. Okay, so uh, I think as we all know that uh, HAI is a major concern in both either uh, healthcare providers and also a patient itself. So it's actually um, continue to escalate and it's quite alarming, um, especially in those in uh, emerging economies uh, compared to the high economy state. Uh, so actually HAI, the healthcare associated patient, not only have, will increase the morbidity, mortality, but it also will increase the length of stay of patient, the cost of treatment and Actually, there's more research and changes in practice that we actually uh, going through now to ensure that the hospital is will be a safe place and to prevent this uh, healthcare associated infection. And actually, WHO already advocated that the effectiveness of the hand hygiene is actually the single most important practice to prevent and control this hospital uh, healthcare associated infection. And um, the CDC also has developed a very comprehensive plan and guideline to actually prevent this uh, health HAI, which is covers the basic uh, IPC, the infection prevention control, uh, the antibiotic resistant, the AMS, uh, the device and procedure associated infection, disease and organism, the M M MDRO, and also the guidance uh, for the health worker working in the specific uh, settings like ICU, uh, HDU, and so on. Okay, so how we actually define the healthcare associated infection. So basically it's an infection 
of a patient that require why they are receiving treatment for another condition in the healthcare setting, such as when they are as inpatient, uh, in the hospital, uh, in the ambulatory setting, in long-term care facilities like the hemodialysis, or it can be just because of unknown origin. Okay, so to define um, actually healthcare associated, infect, uh, healthcare associated infection, so usually the onset will be um, after the 48 hours of admission. Okay, so the organism should be a MDRO organism. So that is the first one. So the second one is if involve the surgical patient. So if uh, the surgery involve um, without any uh, implant, so we take it a month before, within a month. But if they have an implant, like uh, especially the orthopedic side, they will have implant. So they will actually, we take it longer. It's about one year. So within one year, if they have any admission with MDR organism, so the definition is fulfilled for the healthcare associated infection. And the third one, if the patient already being discharged and being admitted again within the 48 hours uh, with the MDR organism, so it's also defined as a healthcare associated infection. Okay. So what we not consider as healthcare associated infection or infection itself. So infection that associated with complication or extension of infection that already present before the admission means that like patient have uh, no history of um, exposure to a healthcare setting and came with some uh, MRSA infection, which is most likely is a community acquired, okay, that was discharged and came back with the same organism. So that is not considered the healthcare associated infection or the infection that actually involved the infant that actually uh, acquired transplacentally from the mother. So it's not considered uh, as a healthcare associated infection as well, although that is actually being emitted through the ward for quite a long time or reactivation of latent infection also not considered as a uh, healthcare associated infection. And when the, uh, the organism is considered as colonizer, uh, which is not uh, actually, it's actually grew from whatever sample that we take, but it still don't cause any disease to the patient. So we call it colonizer. So it's not considered as healthcare associated infection as well. Or there's only inflammation, but doesn't have any culture, take, culture uh, positive. So it's also not considered as HAI. Okay. So what factor is actually affecting patient to develop all this healthcare associated infection? First, most of all, is the immune status of the patient itself. Most of our patients will have lots of comorbids, they have uh, immunocompromised, especially patients like RVD patient, patient with um, uh, on chemotherapy. Okay, so they are very uh, suppressed in immunity, so they are easily to acquire with all the envir environmental organism from the hospital. Okay, uh, secondly, the hospital environment, such as like um, when we have like renovation or construction. So we will actually expose the patient for like infection like aspergillosis or when the aircon is actually uh, out, there's a, actually uh, the aircon is not uh, properly managed. So we'll have leogenosis. Okay, that's his hospital environment. Hospital organism, we have lots of bugs actually around the hospital area. So um, that's what the hand hygiene is all about. Diagnostic and therapeutic interventions like we... Um, do a diagnostic taping, we did a procedure, okay, that will cause also uh, a risk for patient to get an HAI, a medical instrumentation like in intubating patient and prolonged hospital stay. They are, all this is actually uh, providing the patient the risk of getting the hospital acquired infection. Okay, so besides that, um, there are actually uh, increasing resistance of organism in the hospital as well because, because of the overusage of the antibiotic, okay? So we actually, for all those patients that actually admitted, we tend to prescribe antibiotic for them, but sometimes it's not un it is unnecessary, okay? And sometimes it is necessary and it is indicated, but the duration and the, uh, the duration was actually prolonged unnecessarily without uh, our clinical judgment. So we just continue the antibiotic without stopping it then actually it's exposed the patient, the organism to be resistant and actually it will lead to MRSA, VRE, all these uh, MDRO organism. 
Okay, so as I mentioned before, the hospital uh, or, uh, environment, um, like um, there will be like acinato better outbreak. As I mentioned before, the environmental source like uh, construction, cooling tower, okay, or the negative pressure isolation when we actually have to um, properly isolate all the patient with uh, pulmonary TB, chicken pox, okay, in the negative pressure isolation because it's, it's airborne um, transmission. So this is all the factor that actually can lead to the uh, healthcare associated infection as well. So who is actually at risk for the HAI? So when you're getting older, increasing in age or very young, like an infant, um, great length of stay in the hospital, uh, ex uh, extensively or improperly use of broad spectral antibiotic without narrowing it, uh, highest number of invasive devices. So you insert the patient with cannula, you insert the patient with CVC, uh, with CBD, everything that will contribute further for the risk of HAI and the commodity of the patient as well, which actually will uh, increase the risk to uh, to develop the infection. Okay, so besides that, uh, the transmission of the disease between the patient and the healthcare worker. So actually the patient is already fragile. So we as the uh, healthcare worker who actually transmit the infection to the patient through, through our touch, through all the... Um, apa tu? Through all our the devices, maybe the blood pressure machine or the stethoscope that we're using, which is not clean enough. Okay, so we actually spread the disease from one patient to one patient without we actually uh, aware of it. Okay, so besides that, the contamination of the healthcare environment, uh, as I mentioned before, or maybe the outbreak is actually because of the like, for example, maybe the um, MRSA. We have one patient, uh, which if we don't properly isolate or uh, properly manage is as an MRO organism. So we're actually sharing all the uh, medical things and uh, not properly actually uh, having a contact precaution with the patient and spreading the uh, patient, other patient with the same organism. Okay, so how about in uh, ICU setting? So in ICU setting, Actually, the risk of getting HII is uh, a little bit higher uh, because of the condition of the ICU itself because all the patient is actually very immunocompromised, very unwell, okay? And they actually have a very prolonged stay. They already have um, multiple comorbid. They already exposed with multiple antibiotics. So the risk of them to get a uh, hospital acquired infection is actually higher compared to the patient who actually admitted to the general ward, okay, because of the uh, multiple procedures be done and everything. So the source of HDI can be actually divided into two, whether it's actually uh, endo, uh, endogenous uh, or the exogenous source. So the endogenous source too is actually uh, the patient own flora, uh, for example, from the nose, the MRSA, the MSA, the vagina, the fungal, okay, and the exogenous is from the uh, our environment, from the healthcare worker itself, from the visitors or other patient and the patient care equipment. Okay, so the infectious agent actually can be divided into either bacteria, fungi, viruses or other less common type of pathogen. And actually there's around 12 to 70 microorganisms that actually causing 80 to 90% of the healthcare associated infection. So the commonest is uh, the, our staph aureus, uh, enterococcus, especially the faecalis and the physium, E. coli, uh, candida species, uh, clap pneumonia or acetoca, the pseudomonas originosa, uh, acinato bomani. I think all these names is quite familiar for those young actually involved with the work. So because you will see this page, this actually the organism that you will label as the MDRO organism. Okay. So I've moved on to the types of healthcare associated infection. This is based on the KKM Point Prevalence Survey Manual in 2019. Okay, so we have five types of uh, healthcare associated infection. So we have a surgical site infection, urinary tract infection, hospital acquired pneumonia or ventilator acquired pneumonia, bloodstream infection, and also clinical sepsis. So we move to the first one, surgical site infection. So surgical sufficient, as I mentioned before, it developed within 30 days of the surgery. This is without an implant. 
but for set, uh, for a few case, a few uh, case of surgery like prosthetic material, uh, implanted breast, CABG, craniotomy, and all the list that is mentioned there, uh, we took it uh, within ninety days to consider uh, as uh, surgical site infection. So this is uh, specially uh, within this uh, respective things. Okay, but. Um, as we all know, I think we actually under reporting of the surgical site infection. One thing is actually we miss the diagnosis itself because uh, maybe they actually didn't actually turn to the same hospital. They just went to clinic kesihatan or private sector which do the dressing. But essentially, it fulfills the criteria of the SSI. So SSI can be divided into three. The first one is the superficial SSI which actually is just involved uh, from the skin and also the subcutaneous tissue. It's either, um, as you can see, the specimen, actually we can talk uh, either there's a actually drainage, purulent drainage uh, from the subcutaneous tissue through the skin, or you actually it's just, um, um, sorry, it's just uh, above the superficial tissue. This is for the surgical side, uh, the superficial. But compared to the deep, actually it's involved deeper to the fascia and the muscle. So it's actually the purulent uh, discharge will actually uh, break through the fascia and the uh, skin. Or it, it, can, it just can be actually uh, abscess inside the uh, muscle below the incision marking. Okay. Or when it's actually already involved the organ or space, or we call this is a uh, uh, organ or space SSI, which is only it involves lower than the uh, muscle. Okay, so we can actually uh, drain uh, the purulent drainage too through maybe um, pigtail or like procedure uh, tapping everything uh, to actually um, for the source control. Okay, so what is actually the risk factor for patient to get a surgical site infection? Um, first is the advantage. Um, obesity because of the skin um, uh, laxity and or because of the very thick layer of the um, of fascia and the skin. Patient with malnutrition also very risky to get SSI. Diabetes because of the uh, high sugar, poor, di poor control will actually lead to SSI as well. Uh, and if we preoperatively shaving the site, which I don't think we actually implement it now but previously yes we do and uh, inappropriate timing of prophylactic uh, antimicrobial means that whether we give it, it too early or we give it um, we give it on time but we get more than it should be so it's actually also predisposed to the surgical infection what we actually thought that it will be actually to improve the surgical site infection but indirectly actually is the other way around okay so the organism basically based on the uh, what type of the surgical uh, the operation be done? So, kalau uh, if it's clean wound, so most likely it's staph aureus, our normal skin flora. But others like you will get all the hospital acquired infection like, like pseudomonas, the E. coli, ESBL, uh, all uh, the gram negative bacilli uh, infection. Okay, so we move on to the urinary tract infection. So we have two symptomatic UTI or asymptomatic bacteremic UTI. So what we are, our main concern is the uh, is the catheter associated uh, UTI. So the catheter associated UTI is when you insert a catheter uh, more than 48 hours and or you remove a day before the date of the event that patient having the UTI. Okay, so you have will have a positive culture which should not be more than two species of the organism. So if more than that, mix is not considered as a symptomatic UTI. Okay, so what about for asymptomatic bacteremic UTI? Patient have no symptom, uh, but they actually have bacteremia. The blood culture is positive. And when you send the urine culture, the urine culture also grew the same organism like the blood culture. So this is what we consider as a asymptomatic Bacteremic because of the blood culture already positive, asymptomatic bacteremic UTI. So, what actually um, leads to CAUTI or catheter-associated UTI? Still the same, uh, advantage, 
uh, severe underlying disease, um, placement of catheter more than two days if it's not indicated, or female genders. The female gender because of the anatomical uh, ure uh, uretra because we are shorter compared to the male. So we are actually, female is actually higher risk to get the cauti rather than the male patient. So the organism majority is actually gram-negative rods, E. coli, uh, but occasionally they still can have enterococci or staph aureus. Uh, as the cause of the uh, cauti. So hospital acquired pneumonia and ventilator acquired pneumonia. So for diagnosis of hospital acquired pneumonia, you at least have to have one from uh, either fever, should be more than 38 degree, or high or low white cell count. Low means less than four, or raised white cell count more than 12, plus clinical symptom. So you have to have a respiratory symptom such as new onset of prolonged sputum, especially patient bronchiectasis, they're always persistently with her sputum. Uh, so the way that you actually uh, take the history is actually there's an increase of sputum production or the sputum, sputum from whitish become purulent. So it indicates there's an ongoing uh, or new infection is going on. New onset or worsening of cough, dyspnea. Uh, clinically, there's a risk, uh, there's a ronchi, there's a crabs. Uh, or there's a worsening oxygenation. So patient required uh, either oxygen, um, uh, NIV or intubation. That means that the evidence, uh, clinical evidence, plus uh, lab uh, that you have to have culture positive is either from the sputum, tracheal aspirate, pleural fluid, plus another one is imaging. So you have three things, um, uh, clinical, lab, and also imaging for you to diagnose a hospital acquired pneumonia plus the 48 hours tu lah. Uh, you have to have be more than 48 hours plus clinical lab and imaging. So they'll fulfill the criteria of HAP. So what about ventilator assisted pneumonia? It's also almost the same. You have to have all the three. Cumanya you have to be, the patient have to be mechanical, mechanically ventilated for the 48 hours. Maksudnya if like um, patient already in the ward, so, deturated, deturated, you have to require intubation, can. So, after intubate, you already took the uh, sample, the TA sample, and 40 hours later, it grew like pseudomonas. That one is not considered ventilator acquired yet because the sample is take, the patient deteriorated because of the hospital acquired pneumonia. Uh, so, the sample is taken before the 40 hours on ventilator and it's already grew organism. So that is considered hospital acquired pneumonia. You can consider that ventilator acquired pneumonia, for example, like patient intubated for like CCF, the first TA is no growth. Then patient deteriorated, the X-ray become worsening, then you resend the sample, it's grew pseudomonas. Then patient already more than 40 hours on ventilator. Then it fulfills the criteria of the ventilator associated pneumonia. So the the time, the timing of the ventilator, the intubation, and the sampling uh, will actually determine which which is which, whether it's hospital or ventilator acquired pneumonia. So the risk uh, is still the same, um, age, everything. But the most of the thing is like the device related to uh, endotracheal intubation, the prolonged ICU stay. We actually increase further the ventilator associated pneumonia. But sometimes actually the organism can just be a colonizer because of the prolonged stay as well. Okay. Um, and um, last but not least, of course, uh, it's actually because our poor hand hygiene practice, we actually the one that transfer the disease, the organism from another patient to, uh, to our patient that actually causing the ventilator acquired pneumonia. And the most common uh, gram negative rods such as acidental bacter, um, that is quite common uh, in actually tracheal aspirate uh, beside the pseudomonas, uh, steno, okay? This is the most common uh, hospital acquired or ventilator acquired uh, pneumonia lah in the hospital. So, bloodstream infection. So, we have primary bloodstream uh, infection or secondary bloodstream infection. So, what is actually we wanted to focus is uh, for catheter. Uh, related infection. So catheter is can be central or non-central. Okay, so, uh, central is such as the one yang near to the central lah, like macam uh, uh, 
uh, central venous uh, catheter, the PICC, actually all goes into the central line. Yang the non-central is our peripheral line, okay? So how we define the central, uh, the central, the catheter, the uh, central, CRBSI, catheter related, <laughs> catheter related, uh, the better infection, okay? So the catheter, uh should be actually um this is the list of the catheter lah. uh the ijc the patient especially nephro patient our icu patient kan semua kita insert all the central line everything okay and the catheter should be uh there more than 48 hours and um so the risk factor still the same uh age uh extreme age uh, more than 60 or less than one years old malnutrition, low immunity, severe comorbid, prolonged stay, uh, and the, uh, especially patient who have multi-lumen or non-tunnel uh, catheter is more high risk compared to patient uh, yang tunnel uh, catheter. Usually tunnel catheter ni, uh, for example, patient-patient nephro, dia ada yang, uh, apa tu, tunnel yang, uh, dia, apa tu, uh, clavicle punya yang tunnel tu, yang ditanam tu. ah Yang permanent catheter. Ah. Di time tu ni kita panggil uh, tunnel catheter. So that one is actually lower risk to get uh, CRBSI. So that's why we actually use that for those yang ada vascular punya problem, ada vascular access because it's actually more safer than can lose a longer duration. Okay. So last is actually clinical sepsis. So you have to have at least a uh, clinical sign and symptom with no recognized cause. So there's no lung findings, there's no abdominal findings, there's no obvious source. Tapi patient is actually clinically uh, fulfill the criteria of infection, ada fever and hypotensive, plus you have to actually have a positive blood culture uh, 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 and uh, the treatment actually fulfill the, uh, the treatment for the sepsis. Okay, so uh, my team moving to a few uh, end of my slides. So as we all already learned what is healthcare associated infection, so we have to know how to prevent it. Okay, so the prevention um, of HII is actually very broad. Uh, there will be a standard precaution that's under standard precaution too. There's a multiple subtopics as well. Uh, and transmission based uh, or specific uh, precaution, which is I think these two topics will be talked further by uh, another speaker uh, in the uh, in the afternoon. So how we can actually prevent this HAI? So the most important thing is the implementation of the IPC to reduce both exogenous and so endogenous transmission in the healthcare setting. So actually the exogenous transmission is actually more of us as a healthcare worker to our patient, uh, plus minus the environment lah, because we are the ones who are actually touching the environment and then touching the patient. So actually we as a like macam, um, medium for them to get actually infection. So the most important, as I mentioned before, frequent hand hygiene, uh, that is the most actually preventable measures to limit the spread. Uh, compliance to isolation precaution, compliance to the PPE, equipment so if we know what is the organism how they transmittable so we can implement the correct uh, ppe so if you know what organism like macam mrsa is a contact precaution so you know that is actually to implement what is actually the minimal requirement for a uh, ppe for actually involving the patient kalau patient to add uh, like uh, tuberculosis, you know, is airborne. So you have no, you know that you have to actually, if you can't isolate the patient, point, you have to wear N95. Okay, so that is how we actually uh, helping the patient and reduce the healthcare associated infection. Besides that, um, avoidance of unnecessary usage of indwelling device removed as soon as possible. So that there are a CVC bundle. Uh, they actually in overseas they advocate this uh, young um, like removal of uh, like much like UTI bundle. So they actually um, advocate that you have to daily basis assessing the requirement of both uh, whether the CVC is still required, whether the CBD is still required, and if not so, try to remove it as soon as possible because indirectly it will actually promote 
uh, the patient uh, to get a healthcare associated infection. Um, proper aseptic technique, uh, routine disinfectant and appropriate waste management also involved in the prevention of HCI. So hand hygiene, I think hand hygiene ni memang ada hand hygiene day, uh, ada world hand hygiene day, lots of hand hygiene things lah happen. Ada audit lah, what so I think in every hospital everything but things still happen. Uh, the infection still going on, the outbreak still going on uh, because it's still poor compliance. So bila tak ada audit, they will break in terms of the uh, apa tu, hand hygiene punya tu lah kan. Uh, tak ada orang nampak so tak yalah cuci tangan, something like that. Okay, because we don't have the like um, we don't have the kesedaran kot. We don't have the we, you know, we think that is we are of course to do that. Uh, we don't think that it is actually uh, it is our responsibility to do that. Uh, so bila you rasa fuas ni, kita malas nak buat. We, we know it is our responsibility that we don't want our patient to get further deteriorated because of us, because berdosa sebenarnya kan. Uh, tapi kita tak buat tu sebab kita rasa nanti orang tak audit tak apalah, orang tak buat pun kan, bukan orang nampak pun. Uh, so something like that. So actually the lack of awareness, tak ada example kelit, tak ada nak kena tunggu super dia datang ketuk dulu, you, uh, you need you kawal infeksi datang buat spot check, baru nak compliant. Masa tu semua cantik. Tapi hakikat ni actually tak buat pun. Kan? Uh, okay? So poor technique, I think tak ada kot yang dah poor technique, I think everybody dah know how to actually uh, do the apa tu uh, uh, the hand punya hand hygiene punya tu tu hand washing everything lepas tu semua orang dah tahu macam mana nak the five moment things okay uh, okay so surveillance uh, so this is how why uh, kenapa kita kena track uh, our infection so actually why we need to track all the things that happen dekat our ward everything is actually uh, for clinical alert system so means that when we know there's a case we try to find out what is actually causing it so we try to actually um, do something um, monitor it implement new things and actually control it okay so it's actually um, all this data is actually um, um, sometimes memalukan kita jugalah because the increase of outbreak everything but actually it will help us to actually improve um our management in the hospital the hospital care everything and actually um the uh you can do a audit clinical management and qa uh target option and resources everything to actually improve the quality of the uh, patient uh, and reduce the healthcare associated patient in your hospital okay so for hai actually there's still lots of thing uh need to be implement to prevent and there's still lots of ongoing research to identify new strategies to prevent a remaining the remaining HCI that are actually available. So, um, so our strategy is actually okay. So, uh, to reduce the infection, so you have to measure uh, with the surveillance and audit uh, what actually uh, the data says about then you analyze the data so once you analyze the data you improve the infection control activity get the feedback uh, after the practice do a new guideline or flowchart everything and hope that will prevent the transmission so when it's happened again so the cycle will keep on going lah. okay so hoping that if we can actually implement this we can reduce the healthcare in social infection in our hospital okay so i think with that i thank you Sharing <laughs> uh, now we don't do sharing anymore. Ah, but for well, these people, the sharing, but sometimes, some uh, yes, the self the cut back on it. Sometimes you have to share because uh, young... the hair is still there. A lot of they can, you know, funny, kalau kita buat posterior, they stay long, so wider. Like the posterior uh, cervical fixation, uh, memang kita kena shave. Tapi is it advisable to shave or shave before? Mm. So, shave. Yeah, because actually bila kita shave uh, on the same setting kita nak buat operation tu, actually we break the 
skin dia punya skin. tu tu kan ah yeah, the skin tu so bila so, kita buat incision tu actually uh, when we make an incision yeah. tu actually it's a sterile kan tapi our kita ada normal flora kat yeah. sini is our staph aureus so indirectly kita maybe indirectly although kita cuci pun mm. uh, indirectly kita will invade the organism inside so that's the theory behind lah tapi ada tak advisable to shave before that? Actually Baik, tak ada lah I go to juga, Tapi Ni sama je bro Kalau yeah. macam tiga hari efek dia uh, Dia punya hair tu still akan grow kan Tiga hari kan But then still the 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 skin punya integrity tu Boleh being compromised lah Memang dia tak shave Sometimes we have to shave uh, Yelah in certain condition uh, tu condition dia Memang dia kena shave Kalau tidak Memang you punya surgical infection punya uh, Prof is it the same as clipper Prof? Because uh, kalau kita guna clipper, clipper is better, right? Ah, bukan? <laughs> ah, ada special clipper tu macam a special shaver, ah, uh, which is dia tak ada dia, dia punya blade tak indirect contact dengan skin. Dia akan ada a bit gap clipper. <laughs> ah, dia macam dia macam ada protective dia tak, dia punya barrier skin. dekat dia punya blade tu. Saya akan boleh uh, part of uh, nanti venture contract akan suggest lah. Uh, 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 sebab shaving ada yang shave euro ataupun bang lah shave. Yang tempat lain kita shave. Ah uh, kan. Tapi kita pelitnya we, we do we shave sometimes we do facial lamp. So facial yang kita buat kat posisi yang selalu. Kalau uh, kat atas tu ada facial boleh si yang bapak besar yang kita buat kat bawah tu tak ada, tak ada. sebab ah. yang tu tak shift <laughs> sebab mungkin uh, position kot prof sebab dekat sini dia macam skin foam hmm. uh, dia macam moist macam tu dia boleh ada bakteria juga banyak banyak faktor jugaklah prof dia yeah. actually contributing to that macam kita uh, your slide tunjuk tadi memanglah tak boleh dan tu kot tepi kali ha kita kali kali macam kan back kita kok tepi kali yang tu first operation ke atau last second first operation lah first open macam mana Uh, ada sensitivity ada dua lah sebab dia kaca dua tempat kan uh, culture tu uh, uh, maksudnya from surgical side infection lah Prof ya so means that uh, truly maksudnya kalau uh, maybe the operation itself tu clean tapi uh, masa kita management ah uh, management uh. of the wound itself maksudnya masa kita open the wound for inspection uh. the way we handling the wound kita yang contribute Jauh, uh, jauh dia daripada kita punya tangan lah Prof uh, uh, The healthcare uh, yang buat uh, Yang buat tu Macam uh, masa saya kat Sungai Buloh hari tu uh, There's a outbreak of like macam Asinato bacter yang patient neurosurgical ni Actually they break uh, Masa kita orang go through balik tu Kita buat intervention tu Actually um, they break Dia pun dia orang tak scrub the hub je From the EVD tu So EVD uh, tu daripada EVD uh, So patutnya masa nak ambil sampel tu kan dia kena, kena medical officer yang uh, train uh. lepas tu dia kena scrub the hub tu kan uh. yang hub tu dia orang break yang scrub the hub tu je so dia orang actually introduce infection so patient semua dapat infected EVD uh. hmm macam simple simple things yang kita tak perasan uh. Uh. so sometimes we break the simple simple things yang kita rasa macam oh tak benda tu tak tu kita yang actually introduce lah ha uh. saya uh. kita break patient yang memang high risk kita tahu dah sebab memang kita tak nak ada infection mm -hmm. Tapi kalau it happen What happen to my patient last few weeks lah mm. So we talk What we can Apa ni kita reflect balik tengok What is our retail mm -hmm. uh, Lucky it's not this infection So the result of antibiotic But some of the antibiotic tu macam Yelah mungkin Experience play a role as well lah Because some Betul. junior surgeon Dia very tak aggressive Uh. Kalau macam saya tu agresif kalau tu tak very very agresif. Uh. Agresif tu maksudnya apa? Apa? Agresif tu maksudnya apa? Dia suka hit hard. Dia kena dia dua hari tu you nampak dah wound you ada dicat. Takkan you nak tunggu minimum ada you swap and then you chase 
for change your antibiotic atau you find why are there other causes of yeah. that for example macam kata ada kereta atau kereta you nak tu kalau NF kalau operate patient spine melambat-lambat lah dia punya kereta kan eh CV line lah eh IV line lah central line lah semua dia letak hmm. lah tu tak salah dia sebab itu bahagian dia ha, nak. tapi that's the contribute kalau post hoc you have to remove lah tak hmm. nak tunggu seminggu Yeah. Anak, that's why I mean the executive ni kadang-kadang datang buat round, uh, continue the same. Tak tengok pun benda-benda macam ni. Anak. Betul, betul. Actually, um, apa tu yang the CVC bundle, the macam CBD bundle tu actually that's that they already there lah kalau dalam guideline kau overseas. Cuma the implementation je. Betul. Actually CVC tu <coughs> banyak orang tak remove. Eh, saya memang letak pun. Ah, betul. Setengah orang, ni biar tu sebab tak nak cari peripheral line kot Prof. Ah, Hai, inilah rule. Ya. Yeah. Dia dah letak dua kat wall. Ada lagi. Ada lagi. Ada lagi. Kadang-kadang, kalau kita tak buat round, dia biar je. Hmm. Prof, kita dia mengharapkan dia dekat, dekat dekat yang sini lah Prof. Ha? Ni kita punya link-link nurse ni. Ha. Yang ha. tolong ha. jadi kita punya mata, ha. tangan. Ha. 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 Ya. Yeah. Kita punya Betul expectation ni tinggi ha. tau kepada populasi nurses yang ada dekat sini. Kita, yang lah saya marah. Memang saya marah kan. Tapi, awak hmm. kena faham lah. Yeah. Because yang menjaganya saya. Kan? <laughs> <laughs> Kalau yang passion dia, saya boleh balik. Betul. <laughs> kan, pening nak manage lah, <laughs> ya, bro. Ha. I think that's yang tu lah. Kita punya awareness tu actually. Uh, knowledge, awareness. And then you have to interact with your ID lah. Itu ni very important. Sebab mm-hmm. sekarang tu dia tak nak talk tu dia ada betul. Yeah. Dia nak manage ni je. Kadang-kadang dia ingat dia pandai lah. Ya. Sorry to say lah. My, my specialty pun macam tu lah. Dia Satu lagi tahu, Prof. Semua. Saya perasan source control kalau dalam orthopedic tu lah. Tak tahulah. Saya Mana? perasan source, kat, uh, source control tu saya rasa macam delete kalau macam ada. Saya tak tahulah mungkin certain certain condition memang macam kalau implant apa semua tu kita tak boleh remove lah kan. Tapi maybe bila dah ada surgical side infection macam kalau nampak tak respond itu antibiotic maybe ada role of wound yeah. debridement semua kan. Yeah. Sebab sometimes antibiotic tu dah tak boleh nak invade yeah. and the infection yeah. will go deeper yeah. daripada superficial yeah. jadi deep yeah. jadi implant related dah. Ah. Then, Tapi maksudnya wound assessment tu Charging a lot of virus And then sometimes you nampak 0.6 charge Itu kena masuk lah Betul tu, hmm. Sebab ramai yang saya nampak yang macam Macam Prof cakap lah continue the same Continue ah. antibody hoping the miracle to happen Although the infection tu dengan vacuum dressing tu Eh yeah. tak jalan dah But you Kita tak jadi patient ah. Kalau kita jadi patient Kita boleh tahu lah Kita tak jadi patient ni Hmm, uh, especially for those yang ada implant semua kan We try to save the implant tu sebenarnya Saya redo bro Biarlah saya tak Tak ada apa-apa Kita harus make sure Our patient is Apa ni Then Infection Kalau dia We can control Tak payah nak masuk balik Kota Kan, kalau patient yang tak ada ni, kalau saya cakap last week, saya jual. Kalau patient saya, BMI 45, saya nak masuk OT sekali lagi. Risk anesthesia, yeah. risk condition ni, semua sekali ada. Betul. Kalau patient, normal patient yang ideal, tak apalah. Kalau patient yang high risk ni, hmm. bukan setakat tu saja. Kita nak bawa, the ambulance pun nak bawa, aku tak faham. Hmm. Ha. Itulah. Itulah. Uh, kita nak educate doctors ni pun satu challenge dah Kalau semua orang berpendapat macam Prof saya sangat bersyukur Nanti Prof kita orang cik sampai tu promote Kita orang akan ada uh, AMS Infection Control uh, apa tu program uh, conference lah uh, End of 31 Mei sampai 1 Jun We ada satu symposium untuk surgical site infection Which is our speaker Dr. Fadli Otto sini uh, Our surgeon uh, head uh, tu dengan Mr. Jacob So memang one symposium topik untuk SSI kalau prof boleh promote you know, specialist ke MO ke untuk join us. Actually we have one topic sebab so, we think SSI ni banyak yang under diagnose and susah nak manage. Uh, sebab kita nampak simple but it's actually not simple. So we try to gather all the surgeon untuk bagi bagi itulah talk. Tapi you must have a certain number. Tak tak kira you operate tiap kali operate operation infection dan dia masih tak tahu Kan? Ha, kalau you have action, 10-10 kena. Hmm. Kalau 10-10 kena, tak betul lah. Kualiti lah tu, Prof. Kita tengok lah, where is the state, kan? Okay. Ha, 
Okay. Uh, and daripada kita punya audience, ada apa-apa macam sharing of experience ke? Ada apa-apa soalan ke? Uh -huh. Kita chill-chill je, santai-santai je. Betul, betul. Okay, so semua semua aware kenapa kena tahu, kena ada knowledge pasal HAI. Okay. Tak ada soalan? Eh, oh, doktor nak remind, esok ada examination. Eh? Soalan uh, you all kena uh, menjawab uh, 70 soalan yang related tu uh, kita punya infection control. Uh, dan berkaitan juga in, in, topik doktor Nolina adalah included lah. Uh, di mana kita gunakan platform ni untuk kita train you all and to make sure uh, populasi nurses yang ada kat sini adalah yang competent. Uh, dan kita akan uh, follow suit uh, you all punya progression, you all punya competency level tu from time to time. Okay. Sebab kalau nak harapkan team infection control unit ni berapa kerat je yang ada. Uh, jadi kita memerlukan pertolongan dekat you all lah especially yang dekat dengan patient untuk bantu kita sama-sama kita uh, bendung HAI dekat hospital kita. So boleh ya? Dah tak mengharapkan komitmen semua? Okay. Terima kasih. Sembilan dua puluh lima on time. Thank you Dr. Norlina for a very nice presentation on HAI. I'm sure we've learned a lot from you today. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, next to share with us her presentation on prevention and management of sharp injury, I would like to invite Dr. Sarah Binti Azmi, a medical officer from Occupational and Safety Health Unit, Hospital Tengku Ampuan Auzan, Kuantan. Please welcome. Okay, Assalamualaikum and a very good morning to Prof Zamhuri, Dr Hidayah, doctors, nurses and all the link nurses lah as a particip uh, participants today. Eh. Saya Dr Sarah Binti Azmi dari uh, Unit Kesihatan Awam HTA lah and today uh, I was given the topic uh, untuk uh, sampaikan pada semua on prevention and management of traps injury. So I think this will be a macam less heavier topic compared to the previous one. Eh. So um, so introduction a little bit, uh, healthcare workers uh, exposures to blood-borne pathogens as a result of injuries caused by needles and other sharp devices are significant public health concern. Eh? So um, sharp injuries are preventable. So uh, now eh, we have uh, OSHA, eh, if you guys have heard, uh, Occupational Safety and Health Act 1994. Uh, employers, employees, self-employed persons, semua yang berada dalam sebuah facility, they have a duty towards their own safety and towards the safety of others at workplace, okay? So, uh, in every facility should have a program, program for sharp injury prevention, for safety pro uh, program lah, okay? So, uh, programs uh, related to sharp injury should uh, include promoting culture of safety in workplace, eliminating unnecessary of, uh, use of needles and other sharp devices, using devices with sharp injury prevention features. Uh, this is uh, what we call safety device lah. And then employing safe workplace practices and training of healthcare personnel. So um, in KKM setting, we are using this uh, sharp injury surveillance manual uh, since 2007. And we are still using the same one um, as a guideline for us for prevention and also how to manage if uh, sharp injury uh, does occur. So what is needle stick injury? Okay, so I'm sure semua orang kat sini pun tahu lah. So we go to the basic lah, needle stick injuries are wound caused due to puncturing of the skin by medical needles such as hypodermic needles, blood collection needles, suture needles and other needles uh, used for intravenous IV catheter and also include other instruments in OT like, uh, or any like troca or in pathology, glass slides eh, and glass pipettes. Okay, this can uh, severely, uh, be severely hazardous in medical setting and healthcare setting. So coming in contact with any contaminated needle, for example, suture needle, toka, scalp blade, that may lead to exposure to potentially lethal pathogens containing in blood. So injury ni memang, uh, it can involve all the healthcare workers and also our hospital uh, staff, supporting staff juga, macam cleaner, semua tu. So everyone in the hospital. So um, 
we know that blood ha, um, can cause uh, other uh, infection. Okay. So the most yang lead, uh, fatal can lead to fatal yang kita worried of is HIV, hepatitis B and hepatitis C. So say just tunjuk a little bit of rate of shark injury in Pahang. Yeah? So this is the incident uh, in two, from 2016 to 2022. Tapi I have the yang 22 until June saja because they haven't finalized the one until December. So if you look, uh, kadang incident Pahang actually uh, uh, apa ni, rendah lah daripada kadang incident satu Malaysia. And uh, yang Pahang punya, yang ni saya dapat half je lah. So dia nampak sangat rendah for the first half of the year last year lah. Nampak rendah lah. Tapi actually kita punya aim untuk um, like to say indicator, kita aim for zero incident sebenarnya. Kita tak nak ada incident of sharp injury in a hospital. Ya. Yeah. Ya. Yeah. Um, yang ni yang saya dapat dari JKN. Uh, dari Pahang. So um, ni dia ialah a per seribu jumlah healthcare worker yang uh, tu per seribu dia punya rate uh, per seribu healthcare worker dia punya rate lah dia kadar uh, uh, dia punya kadar uh, uh, dia kira macam tu dia bukan kira percentage dia kira per seribu uh. okay so who can get injured eh Nah, macam gelap sikit eh. So who can get injured? So healthcare workers lah. We have nurses, doctors, lab staff, medical assistant, dentist and also our hospital support service cleaner eh. So when do cleaner actually get uh, apa ni, uh, injured? Actually bila dia cleaning kan? Bila kita sendiri as healthcare worker yang membuat prosedur um, kena bertanggungjawab dengan prosedur yang kita buat. We don't leave needle on the floor eh. We have to Uh, immediately dispose in the shark bin. If not, kalau cleaner nak clean the tray, clean the floor, they will get injured. Okay, not during the procedure, but during cleaning. Okay, so risk factors. Okay, so risk factors. We go to um unsafe needle device. Um, we have to have a good satisfactory quality of needles, and another option is to use safety device, which I will explain later. And then the practice of recapping needle shouldn't be uh, there anymore. Lah. Uh, you shouldn't recap needle and put back inside the tray. Needle should be disposed into the sharp bin immediately after each procedure. And then improper disposal of sharps. So all healthcare workers should follow as SOP lah for disposal at, uh, at workplace. And then uh, other risk factor would be improper technique or procedure. Healthcare worker. Uh, should follow safe techniques and hospital should have written protocol for invasive procedures. And then unsafe handling of sharps. So while handling of sharps, one should see their own and other safety. Like uh, holding the sharp correctly or doing operation. When you do operation, there's a, there's a way how to pass your instrument back. Kan? Uh, that's how you use tray ke, or you there's, there's a way to hold. Kan? Uh, you tak pass dengan yang belah tajam tu kepada the other person. And then unexpected movement of the patient is also a risk factor during a procedure. So you have to explain properly to your uh, patient. Okay, uh, you introduce yourself and then you explain procedure apa yang you nak buat. Even if it's just a simple blood taking procedure, you can explain. And then uh, continuous communication. Yeah? Sometimes bila ada, kita ada staff yang mengambil darah patient and then suddenly patient to just gerak. Uh, so you kena continue oh pakcik saya still ambil darah ni jangan gerak ya. Uh, saya uh, bagi kerjasama benda macam tu. So you have to have a continuous communication with your patient. So going to mechanism of injury. So when do this injury occur? It's like disposing of used needles and other materials used in the procedure. Sudden movement of patient during injection. Recapping the needle. Transferring uh, fluids or blood between the containers. Uh, do, uh, this, uh, and then failure to dispose of used needles in the sharp bin. So these are the times bila needle to can occur. Okay, uh, the needle injury can occur. So um, how do you prevent uh, needle stick injuries? Yeah? So first one, you have to have safety measures. In hospital, you have to have like a uh, macam Uh, a written like label, label your uh, label kat sini barang, kat mana, uh, you have to have safety measures. Your sharp bin should have, uh, should be put at a visible area, okay. 
Um, and then the second one would be education, training, and awareness. Okay, to all to all the healthcare workers. And then work practice control. You have to have SOP. Okay. So, macam tadilah, cara nak pas barang. And then, you have SOP of your procedure, you have to follow SOP. Okay? And then, you have to have, a, you can have a protection against uh, Hep B vaccination. Uh, Hep, B vac uh, Hep B, dia ada vaccination. So, this is one of the way uh, to protect you if needle stick injuries occur. So, being exposed to needles or body fluids means that another person's blood or other body fluid touches your body. So, things that you can do, do not uncover or unwrap needles until it's time to use. And then, keep the uh, needle pointed away from yourself or other people at times. This can ha happen like during emergency. You have patient collapse and then you need to take the patient's blood. You ambil. And then, you just bawa jarum to merata. Okay. You you should have you tak boleh buat macam tu. You have to have tray lah kan. Uh, and if not, you can injure others. Okay. Uh, that's an example lah. Okay. So and then you have to follow organization policies, protocol, and report immediately. Uh, in case of any exposure. So never recap or bend a needle, and then keep your fingers away from the tip of the needle. And follow SOP. Eh? So. The next one would be provide a supportive and safe hospital environment for the employee. Dispose needle stick properly to cold container after you use it. Okay. So there are many posters okay, on sharp needle, uh, needle in skin injury prevention. So kita boleh tengok ada banyak. And then we have to actually in your unit, you should have these posters as awareness to others. Eh? So um, disposing sharps. Okay. So items that go into the sharp means usually like all the needle lah, yang semua benda yang tajam-tajam tu kan, all the uh, trocar, all the needles and blades and retractor, okay, that you use in your procedure and operation. So when you you dispose your sharp, bila you punya container dah uh, more than three quarter full, you should follow guideline for proper disposal. Okay, close the sharp bin, close the lid and um, have to change to a new container. Jangan put uh, letak letak sampai dia penuh tolak tolak dengan uh, apa and inilah for set or anything so because bila full tu dia akan menyebabkan injury maybe to yourself or maybe to those yang akan collecting the a cleaner lah yang akan collect the sharp bin okay so <clears throat> and then if you like wait for example you don't have the sharp bin available so uh, at the time letak barang barang yang tajam tadi at the temporary safe uh, location label it or just put it aside lah at the safe place uh, before uh, before you get the new sharp bin. So the container uh, of the sharp bin should be placed in visible location. Okay, so below eye level and container should be uh, placed away from any obstructed area. So kadang-kadang kita macam tengok dekat satu kawasan tu macam buat tu mungkin penuh. Dia letak je main letak sharp bin. Dia kena letak dekat visible area. Dia tak boleh letak bawah sink. Dia tak boleh letak bawah belakang pintu because dia tak, tak boleh ada obstacle. So bila you nak dispose, uh, you directly boleh assess the sharp bin. Okay. You tak, tak boleh letak dekat tempat yang ada obstruction. Okay. And the um, it should be clearly visible to all healthcare worker lah. Okay. So, uh, things that some people do lah. Uh, so, dia remind do not uh, force sharp bin into container. Okay. Tolak dengan tangan ke. Tolak dengan apa benda lah. Dengan any benda tak boleh. Jangan break or uh, bend or break the needle. Do not remove needle. Some people ada buat macam ni. Macam maybe dulu dekat pits, dia orang break the needle and ambil macam tu. Do not do that. Do not put fingers inside container and do not recap needle. Okay. So what if sharp injury do occur lah. Okay. Uh, apa kita kena buat? What is your next step? So do not panic. Terminate the procedure. Remove glove. Do not put finger in mouth or squeeze. Nak keluarkan darah tu. You just immediately wash your hand under running water and soap. Do not scrub the wound. Do not use bleach, okay? And then dry the wood and report you punya uh, injury to immediately notify to your supervisor, okay? And then seek for medical treatment. <coughs> so how do you manage needle stick injury if you occur? So, so uh, you did all that steps just now and then kita kena report. So usually when you report um, the injury, 
uh, it has to go under reporting lah, under hospital. Like us, we have to go uh, until JKN level uh, and KKM to report the incident. So there are so many things that uh, uh, you can add the detail of the stuff involved lah. Okay, like name, IC, contact number, and department, duration of the job, like experience. Okay, and then you have to have detail of the incident, date and time of incident, uh, date and time of reporting, location of incident because you have to report immediately. Okay. So, and then procedure involved, okay, instruments used and how the injury happened. For the patient, you have to have the detail of the patient as well. The diagnosis of the patient, risk factor of the patient, okay. So, and then you have to have the result of for infective screening of the patient. Whether they are the previous one, if it doesn't have, you have to take immediate Um. Uh, like a, a result for the patient and you have to kena ada result to within uh, 2 to 72 hours result to because you kalau patient to other risk like HIV, HIV, Hep C you kena start uh, immediate treatment for your staff yang injured tu kan so the effective treatment would be within 2 to 2 until 72 hours to start post-exposure prophylaxis so you have to have the result of the patient immediately and then um, risk assessment others like sexual behavior dia ke I video or having tattoo and details of the incident, like wearing, wear, uh, the staff wearing glove, how depth is the penetration, and then the staff had B vaccination status. So important risk assessment, eh? <clears throat> you need to decide on post-exposure prophylaxis uh, for the staff. So we have a PP for HIV, antiviral, and we can give also for Hep B. Kalau dia tak tahu dia punya vaccination status, you can give uh, IVIG Hep B. So, yeah, so like, like we repeat, like uh, B, uh, hepatitis C, HIV lah, are the pathogens yeah, that we want to uh, prevent, okay? So, this is the manual that I show. And then under KKM punya program, we have the um, details of the patient, details of the staff, and then risk assessment. And also, we follow up until six months. Bila healthcare worker to injured, you have to follow up until six months to see zero conversion. Okay, you have to monitor. Maybe you repeat the baseline for the staff, HIV, 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 C for the baseline. And then six weeks later, three months after that, and until six months because we have window period for six months. Okay, so can you follow up uh, staff too. And after six months, you can be relieved. Lah. Okay, there's no serial conversion. So staff too, okay, uh, you, you are happy. Lah. Okay. Um, so a little bit on uh, safety device. tadi, most of hospital actually use normal, uh, still normal, uh, branula needles more. Yeah? but we have these safety devices. They are blood taking device. Uh, with a passive fully automatic needle stick protection. Okay, so uh, dia in which when you take blood of the patient, I'm sure uh, orang uh, small clinical staff kan, mungkin pernah dengar. So I just uh, show a little bit on safety branula lah. I'm not sure whether you guys use here. Safety branula uh, is when bila you ambil darah, the, at the end of it tu, dia akan automatic uh, tertutup. Some company, they have plastic cover at the end. Some company like B. Brown, they have macam uh, apa daripada metal lah, dia tertutup. So I'm not sure kat sini ada guna safety branula ke? Tak ada. Huh? Okay. So dia macam uh, like uh, if you, it's a bit expensive compared to the normal one. So dia macam kadang-kadang uh, kita just guna untuk patient yang berisiko lah. HIV, uh, patient hepatitis. Yeah. Dia macam bila you tar, bila you ambil darah, <coughs> bila you ambil darah and then when you remove retract di belakang, the automatic closure. So there's no risk of the needle to injure anyone and also tak ada contact blood dekat hujung tu. Uh, itulah function dia sebenarnya uh, macam tu. And some people kan when you take blood, you like to, kita sepatutnya tak ada transit eh. You have to dispose immediately and, and, uh, into shark bin. Tak boleh letak dalam tray. That's not the right SOP. You kena terus letak dalam shark bin. Tak boleh letak dalam tray. Because kalau you kumpul-kumpul dalam tray, after that you tak sedar jarum tu kan. Uh, bila you nak kemas tu, uh, that's when needle stick injury can occur. You letak dalam kidney dish ke, jarum tu boleh tercucuk. Uh, kan nanti bila you tak sedar tu. So, uh, walaupun you ada this kind of device, uh, uh, brand safety branula, you still, kita still kena practice uh, proper SOP lah, which dispose immediately lah. Tapi this is to prevent lah actually. Yeah. <clears throat> Other safety device, macam kalau needle, dia ada macam cover. Like when you take the blood, it can cover atas tu. Tutup atas tu, so dia prevent shark injury. Uh, syringes, um, 
when you after you use you tarik the syringe needle tu akan masuk dalam syringe tu okay like brown uh, a butterfly safety scalp vein pun kita ada juga and then we to uh, cover HTA kat kita, kita ada guna lah a few With you, uh, kita pernah guna all these Branula semua needle tu tak pernah, Branula and also safety scalp vein, so after you use you immediately cover, so they reduce you be less injury to the uh, healthcare worker, okay alright so I think that's all actually on shark injury, it's a very simple topic so kalau ada soalan ke boleh tanya, thank you Okay, ada soalan lain kepada Dr. Sarah. Uh, Dr. Sarah ni basically daripada unit kesihatan, unit kesihatan awam di HTA. Kalau dekat HTA, UKA yang handle uh, shark injury. Tapi kalau dekat SASMED ni, uh, kita tak ada unit kesihatan awam lagi insya Allah dalam proses untuk penubuhan. So sementara kita nak tunggu UKA kita wujud, uh, memang infection control lah yang cover. Uh, so basically... Uh, uh, Most of the content yang Dr. Sarah uh, dah deliver hari ni basically kita dah ada knowledge. Dia lebih kepada revision dan reminder macam tu lah kan. Uh, cuma uh, kita punya isu dekat SASMED ni kalau dari segi reporting yang Dr. Sarah uh, apa uh, obligation of the hospital untuk uh, submit the data kepada uh, state level untuk data shark injury ni? Uh, setakat ni tak pernah submit ke? Uh, setakat ni uh, data yang infection control peroleh, infection control akan submit ke OSH Department SASMEC dan uh, apa yang OSH buat dengan uh, data tu mungkin kita kena uh, tak, tanya tak, bagi tak, orang balik lah macam mana uh, DHTAA, uh -huh. uh, kita, OSH kita bawa UKA lah uh, uh -huh. saya, saya actually OSH juga, uh, maknanya OSH juga kita benda yang sama okay. UKA dan OSH adalah satu, uh, maknanya kita ada UKA, bahawa kita adalah UKA dan OSH. Uh -huh. So if you dah submit to your OSH unit, so it's the right, um, I think it's the right step lah. Okay. So I'm sure OSH unit sini, um, diorang pernah datang juga jumpa kami uh -huh. masa dia nak set up tempat dia uh, proper. So kat sini ada je OSH unit kan? Ada. Uh, uh -huh. So I'm sure dia, uh, but I'm not sure you guys use the same form ke reporting card? Uh, tak. Okay. Mula-mula uh, uh, untuk uh, uh, masih kita nak device mechanism untuk reporting tu uh -huh. Kita ada tengok jugalah yang form yang Dr. Sarah tunjuk tadi tu uh -huh. Form biru tu uh -huh. uh, Dan basically kita pada fasa awal kita adapt uh -huh. Dan adopt guna form tu Tapi uh, currently kita dah go uh, semua digital uh -huh. So reporting adalah ikut apa? I aduan uh, Semua pun masuk I aduan So uh, OSH pun retrieve result daripada situ lah hmm. uh, So reporting of shark injury is important lah Memang kita nak mereka report Kita kena ada data tu Supaya kita boleh investigate Why injury to occur So kita kena ada data tu So I think kalau UIA dah report ke OSH unit hmm. So OSH unit sini uh, I have to follow OSH unit sini <laughs> Mereka hantar ke mana yeah. uh, But I'm sure maybe uh, is uh, Mana data tu kan hmm. Whether dia akan masuk bawah data yang tadi yang sama ke yeah. Atau dia Tapi data yang asing tu Dari segi hmm. uh, dissemination of uh, data kepada level hospital Tak ada isu sebab hmm. kita ada incident report committee meeting Regularly hmm. yang akan review re result yeah. uh, Ataupun data shark injury tu Which is uh. OSH, OSH tu lah uh, Betul, betul yeah. uh, Dia orang yeah. yang uh, coordinate lah hmm. So I think that's the right step lah Yeah so, So whether OSH unit tu dia ada obligation untuk uh, hantar data tu ke JKN saya tak pasti yang tu lah hmm. uh, Sebab selalunya is a different entity ke lain yeah. kan lah eh, Dr. So, Aisyah ada apa persoalan? Dr. Aisyah ni orang orang uh, utamalah yang handle shark injury ni orang dalam meeting uh, <laughs> Orang baru <laughs> uh, Orang baru nak belajar Okay um, sebab uh, data from the data collected in SASMAC ni kita mm -hmm. banyak uh, nampak uh, berlaku shark tu disebabkan oleh butterfly needle. Uh, so kalau kita sebab the the main problem of scarven ni adalah dia recoil. Ha ah, yeah. kan. So, so the injury masa dia dispose. Masa dispose. Ha ah. uh, so um macam from your experience lah kan kalau macam kita kita takkanlah kita nak terus suggest kepada guna device yang mm -hmm. close Ha, uh, harga dia memang saya, saya try compare harga dia Kalau macam yang scalping biasa ni Satu uh, satu pack tu dalam 100 Harga dia dalam 20 lebih Lepas tu hari tu saya try lah Tanya company lain kan Yang ada safety device tu 50 pieces per pack tu hmm. 50 lebih 
Which is lagi dia sangat berbeza lah. Hmm. Ha, so hmm. macam nak nak. Macam almost half macam tu kan? Ya yeah, ya. Yeah, ha. Dan dia punya uh, yang apa? Bilangan dia pun sangat 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 sikit lah. Uh, dekat sini uh, ram, uh, maknanya ramai staff sini suka gunakan CFT device ni compact to normal needle ke? Ah, uh, From yang saya tanya tu sebab nurses yang ambil kat sini sebenarnya Dia darah banyak kan? Uh, 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 sebab kita tak ada apa HO kan? Uh. Uh, so nurses yang ambil so diorang suka guna. So yang itu pun macam salah satu benda yang 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 inilah menyebabkan berlaku banyaklah juga kan disebabkan oleh scar vein tu. I uh, understand that macam prosedur yang macam contohnya like uh, macam kalau you nak ambil blood culture kan. Mm. Blood culture kan sampai nak 20 ml. Mm-hmm. Uh, mesti dia nak pakai ni kan sebab syringe besar kan. Mm. Uh, maybe can advise like macam bila nak uh, another option lah. Like you use forceps lah. Forceps, long forceps. Masa nak buang Masa tu kan. Masa dispose uh. tu. Uh, but a proper... Oh tu lah kita hmm. kita dah try advice lah Ta- hmm. tapi kita cuba juga untuk diorang limit lah penggunaan hmm. tu kalau tak perlu so hmm. kita kena cuba try guna yang normal needle dulu lah hmm. itu yang setakat ni yang kita kita propose lah ha, tapi ha, macam tu lah <laughs> Bila coiling tu kan dia sangat susah sebab chart beam pun rupa macam tu kan tapi the only way I can see if you tak boleh beli yang ni long for set lah kan uh, untuk uh, Uh, just masukkan dia ke dalam lah. Okay. Uh, so kita tekankan penggunaan tu je lah kan. For, for kalau sense. diorang nak uh, still nak use banyak guna hmm. ni kan. Uh, Scout uh-huh. baby. Maybe have to put like a poster ni. Yeah. <laughs> Before <laughs> reminder. <laughs> uh-huh. Okay. Ada apa-apa soalan tak daripada linus-linus kita? Kalau tak ada soalan, doktor nak tanya. Ha, tiba-tiba ada soalan. Ha, bagus. Hmm. Masa mula nak guna tu okay. oh, Mungkin recommendation yang bagus uh, Kalau uh, nurse-nurse di tempat-tempat di ward-ward ni Mungkin boleh advice lah Kalau nampak ada kawan-kawan Ataupun you all sendiri nak guna That butterfly needle Mungkin boleh implement apa yang Uh, sister ni bagi tahu. Ha? Uh. Mana tahu membantu uh, uh. Lagi? Ada apa-apa lagi? Input, uh, komen, soalan Narak tu Kita orang pun tak ada Oh HTA pun tak ada ha. Patutnya kena guna. Kita pernah juga ada shot injury staff bila masukkan macam tu dia tak stable kan. Dia tak stabilize macam tu. Terus kita cucuk. Uh, always still lah. It's a very difficult thing lah sebab memang sepatutnya ada rak tu. Tapi bila tak ada tu kita always have you kena fokus lah. Sebenarnya bila you buat posi dia tu selalunya bila kita tanya dia orang tak fokus. Ah, uh, Dia orang sibuk dengan orang lain berborak sambil ah uh, selalunya bila kita invest sikit always bila buat posi tu kena fokus lah. Tapi memang lah. Uh, yang sepatutnya ada ada uh, rak tapi kalau kita tak ada tempat tu fasiliti tu dia kena ada dia punya guideline you don't have this so apa uh, reminder for your staff macam tu lah uh. <laughs> selalu yang tu macam orang yang patuh untuk guna macam dekat lab uh, dekat klinik bersepadu yang memang uh, ambil darah memang tugas dia ambil darah je yang tu kan tapi kan doktor nak bagi tahu yang pasal yang uh, specimen holder tu basically tube-tube blood yang you all guna dekat ward tu basically datang dekat lab dalam satu holder dah polystyrene holder ah uh, uh, doktor rasa kalau ada lab-lab yang uh, ward-ward yang nak guna benda tu mungkin kita boleh coordinate distribution kita boleh kumpul uh, uh, packaging tu daripada lab nanti kita akan distribute ke ward polystyrene yang ada lubang untuk letak tube doktor rasa itu membantu kan Hmm. Okay Okay ada apa-apa lagi Input Okay Alright So now oh, Dr. Aisyah Thank you
Thank you, Dr. Sarah, for a very informative uh, presentation. Now, uh, we have a better understanding regarding sharps and what are the complications they might get from the sharp injury. Please remember the slogan, safety first before doing any procedure, okay? So, brothers and sisters, we have heard from our speakers to important topics. And after the break, you will find uh, more interesting topics. Now, we have to refresh ourselves for a few minutes. The refreshments will be served at outside of the auditorium. Uh, please do not leave your personal belongings behind for security. And uh, we... Huh? Oh, okay, okay. Sorry, sorry. So I would like to <laughs> so I would like to invite Dr Hidayah uh, to give a token of appreciation to our two speakers. Eh, Dr. Dr. Oh, oh, Dr Sarah, sorry. <laughs> hey, Doctor, please welcome to the stage. <laughs> oh, like bawah aja, okay. Camera ready. Doktor nak kat bawah je. Eh, kita ada dekat bawah ke? Okay, thank you Dr. Sarah and Dr. Nur Hidayah. Um, okay, uh, so that's it. Um, boleh pergi ke nilai? Okay, so you all, all of you are invited to uh, take uh, like refreshment at outside of the auditorium. So please come back uh, into the auditorium. Uh, uh, into please come back at Audi at ten fifteen a.m. As uh, the next session will start right after the tea break. Thank you. <laughs>